All right. And we're live with Steve Wong. Hello. I I think it's pronounced Wong, right? Like that's what right. that's Yes, Wong yeah. is the correct we're pronunciation, live. but when I first immigrated here, they just mm -hmm. say your name is Wang and I'm like, no. "Okay, I never heard of that before, but sure, why not?" It's the British A. Right. It's not the American A. Uh, that transliteration doesn't carry over very well. Yeah. I've had I've had people call me to solicit ads, and it's very obvious they were Chinese on the other end. And then here, I'm looking for Steve Wong, and I say, yeah, this is Steve Wang. And he's like, well, thank you, Mr. Wong. And he corrects me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's pretty funny. Yeah. Uh, well, th uh, thank you for uh, for doing the Action Talks episode. It's been it's been some months since we talked, and yeah. uh, uh, we talked about Drive. Uh, we talked about Giver, and uh, so now we um, on the live streams. Uh, we have a, a segment on some live streams now where we do um, as you see it. So we'll or, uh, how you see it uh, is what we're calling it. And we have a few clips that we'll go through later on. Uh, but I thought I'd just uh, I'd just catch up with you and ask uh, career wise, you know, what uh, where are you right now? What are you doing? Well, um, ever since I finished Common Rider Dragon Knight, which I think we we showed the show in 2009, um, I've moved back to doing uh, makeup effects. And I started my own studio and I've gone through a few iterations from Biomorph Studios to Alliance Studio. And now, I mean, I'm my studio now is called uh, Onyx Forge Studio. And basically, I got into making all these life-size statues for video game companies. Uh, and did a lot of sort of live experiential kind of stuff to art installations, bronze statues and whatnot for quite a while. And then every so often, I would dip back into film. Like we did, I did Batman versus Superman, did a creature for that. Did um, Bill and Ted uh, face the music. Uh, recently, we did Shazam 2. We did the costumes for Daughters of Atlas, like all the armor suits for them. Um, and then most recently, uh, the show I'm a Virgo uh, by Boots Riley. Yeah, we did the the hero costume for Walton Goggins. So yeah, and, the right, and currently we're working on a commercial right now. Um, I can't really talk about the commercial, but we're doing some fun like creature characters for the commercial right now, and that's due in two weeks from now. So. Can you talk about I'm a Virgo? Because I almost worked on that and I know Boots very well. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was just, uh, we just got a kind of a random call. We're in the middle of doing um, this, this Miami bull. It's like this giant like tribute to the, the, the Wall Street bull statue in New York, this bronze bull. And we're doing kind of the, the, the Transformers version of it. Um, and then uh, I got a, I got a call from costume designer Deidre Govan, and she says that, oh, I'm working on this TV show with Boots Riley, and I was familiar with Boots' work already, so I was very excited. I was like, yeah, this is great. You know, what do you need? And she's like, well, we're doing this costume called the Hero, and she gave me some renderings of what kind of basically what it looks like, you know. And so we collaborated with her, and uh, we made the the costume for her. Went on set, we tried it on Walton. He, he was awesome, you know. And uh, yeah, then they shot. We left. We left one of my crew members there to kind of help attend to the costume, and uh, along with their costume people. And then you know, it's uh, business as usual. So what uh, what was involved in making the costume for this character? Yeah, we had to take uh, once the design was established, we sculpted it with my cat, you know, and then then Deidre and Boots approved it. Then we basically had to do a, a scan of Walton. So we had to fly a couple of guys to New York uh, to to do his cyber scan and they sent us the data and then we took it and we printed a life-size uh, mannequin of him from there we did we did most of the costume traditionally sculpted in clay we had some digital elements that we did like the helmet and you know some different pads here and there but it was mostly traditional then we sculpted we molded body shop clean made all the elements and then came the costume aspect which was like a a spandex kind of suit but it was all we, we custom designed all this kind of electro electronic circuitry kind of a look and had it all printed on the suit, put it all together and then all the armor pieces on the top. Um, and they made it all flexible urethane. So it's very comfortable to wear, you know, like if he ever falls down, he's not going to hurt him or anything like that. So yeah. And Walton was a total sport. He looked great in it too. What was the purpose of the full body scan and the, the printout of the full body? Was it to test the, the outfit on it? Um, no, it, yeah, that, but primarily it was so that we can sculpt a costume for him that will custom fit him really nice. Because if you, I don't know if you've seen the costume, but he looks, he looks like Adonis. He's got this beautiful kind of 
V-shape, you know, to him, big shoulders. And so we, we always work off of the actor's own body so we can make sure whatever we design the sculpt will look the best. Um, I can't remember what movie it was, but I had to go in. Oh, it was for ABCs at that too. I had to go in and have a head cast made of me. And that's mm -hmm. where they put the, they cover your face and they put two little straws in your nose. <clears throat> yeah. And, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I understand that um, that can be a very difficult experience for people. Um, so yeah, do you, possible. yeah. So do you do you do that process as well for when doing head molds for people now? Yeah, we we do both. It depends. Uh, we've done a lot of scanning as well, and scanning works just fine. Uh, for makeups, we tend to try to do more of a traditional. You know, we use a stuff called body double, which is a faceting silicone, and then we take a plaster bandage mold off of it so we can reuse that mold. Um, whereas traditionally they use alginate, which, which is probably what you had, this white material, right? It's really cold. Yeah. Um, and that's more like a one-time use situation. But for prosthetic makeups, we still tend to prefer that, but we can do scans and the scans, they, they work just as well. They're, they're, they're perfectly fine as well. So uh, I think most actors prefer scanning because you're, you're just in it for like a few seconds. So it's very fast. Huh. Well, that's... Uh... It's interesting, uh, interesting use of technology, and that that was. So did you work at all on the um, on the main character for I'm a Virgo, or was it just the just the hero's outfit? Yeah, just, just a suit. We made also a half scale uh, posable statue for uh, him, you know, because they made a lot of the half size people. Yeah. So because we're making the costume, we ended up. They gave us a head of Walton Goggins already made, and we just made the body and we made the, all the armor and everything to go with. Yeah, Boots is interesting because in um, in Sorry to Bother You, he uh, he had a um, he had animatronic, you know, heads made for those horses, and mm -hmm. I and I was on set when those things came, and you know, these are guys that have worked on Predator, you know. Yeah, you talk about ADI, uh, um, Tom Woodruff, Al Gillis. Yeah, there I Al Gillis gave me my first job actually back in nineteen eighty five. It's amazing was... stuff. Um, I don't know if we talked about how how you got interested. In creature design um were you watching those films you know before you got into uh design oh yeah yeah actually that was you know making monsters that's my first love i mean above and beyond even filming um when i was a kid i used to always draw monsters and stuff and then when i i watched ultraman ultraman changed my life you know i mean well, how do you go wrong with guys in big rubber suits beating the shit out of each other right <laughs> so and look at the films i've made right so um so I've always loved it since I was a kid. I had, had an obsession with monsters and monster suits. So by the time I immigrated to the U.S. in 1975, um, and watched all the universal horror films and all the films that were available in the U.S., that just blew my mind. And then seeing around, it was around Halloween time, and seeing that they sell latex rubber masks, which I had never seen in my life. And that, I was so obsessed with that, I ended up collecting that for about four years. I, I collected about 30 of them. And that's when I decided, you know what, I need to know how the, these things are made. So I started, uh, I found out through library books and behind the scenes, like, you know, 15 minutes of making of King Kong or something at 3 a.m. between two movies they show on TV. This is pre-VCR days. Um, I would see this stuff and go, oh, it's like you have to do a sculpture over the head cast and you got to make mold. And so, so over time, I started to find uh, books and magazines and started kind of to teach myself through these tutorials and whatever info, info I can get. Five years into that, teaching myself, I ended up putting together a portfolio, went to LA, knocked on doors, and the first person to hire me was Stan Studio, which Al Gillis was working at. And from there, I just started kind of to develop more of my skill as I went. But mostly, like like most people in my generation, we're all self-taught, and we go down to Hollywood and try to get work. And then we learn on the job. And, I mean, but you're self-taught, even though even though there was so much of this already going on. Uh, one of the scenes we're going to talk about is from a Sinbad movie, but Harry Housen was doing these creature mm -hmm. effects and, and all of this. Uh, what was the, was, is there a culture around, you know, animatronics creatures and whatnot in Hollywood when you started out? And was that a very do it yourself culture? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was actually, um, it was a very exclusive thing in the sense that, you know, this is, you know, decades before YouTube and all that stuff. So information, wherever information you can find, you'll find in magazines, you know, like Cinemagic, Cinefantastic, like Starlog, uh, Fangoria, right? They would have little tidbits on, you know, this is how they've made some of the stuff and they'll talk about it. 
And, and so you you just kind of as a, as a big monster fan would have to extrapolate this information and go, oh, I think this is how they do it, you know. And every so often you get lucky, like Cinemagic, Magic, they'll do tutorials on how to make a rubber mask or how to do something. And then you got to go and try to find these materials and then try it yourself in your own kitchen and screw it all up a few times before you kind of like figure it out. Um, so that was like, that was how most people of that generation learned. Um, I think during that time and before that, there was a whole uh, studio apprenticeship program, like John Chambers, who did uh, Planet of the Apes. You know, he had like apprentices, like Tom Berman was one of his apprentices and Tom went on to become one of our very well-known makeup, you know, uh, legends in our business, along with Rick Baker, Dick Smith, you know, Stan Winston, like all these, these old timers, you know? And so that was a generation I grew up with, like following the works of these guys. And so, um, you know, it was, it was all, all a mystery because, you know, like I said, the information was hard to come by. So we had to build up our own portfolios and fig, kind of figure out, oh, well, how do I get down there and find work? We figured, well, I got to put together, show my, what I can do. But by the time I had it's five years of this in a portfolio, I went down to LA and so I'm not going to And I was very lucky that all my hard work did pay off. You know, I was hired like the first week I was there. I started getting jobs, you know, first job was Stan Winston. As soon as I finished that job, I went to go meet with Rick Baker, who was like one of my idols, you know. Um, it was surreal to meet him. And then he hired me on the spot. And I worked on Harry and the Hendersons as a sculptor. And that was like, holy crap. Uh, I'm Harry and the Hendersons, man. I'm 19 years old and I'm sculpting for Rick Baker, like my idol, you know. And so that was crazy. So I, I was, at that point, I started to realize, okay, maybe maybe my skill set is a little bit higher, you know, uh, high enough, I can say, to get the kind of job that I want, which is sculpting, painting, and creating monsters and stuff. So after that time, I started, you know, just getting more and more creative opportunities. Within one year, uh, a little bit over one year, I got to do Monster Squad for Stan Winston, doing the, the Gilman creature with my roommate, Matt Rose, who's passed away about four years ago. Um, and then got to do Predator, you know, like a year into the business. I was given this huge opportunity, you know, but I'm 20 years old, and I'm given this opportunity, and I, and I, I co-designed it with Stan and I built it for him. I had a little crew, with, you know, along with Matt and then my friend Shannon who organized everything. And I was so lucky that when the movie came out, it became so iconic that my phone was ringing off of it. And my career was more or less set. Then I was getting all these opportunities after that and they never stopped. So very lucky. What do you think, what's your, what's your cultural read on our interest in creatures as an audience? That's an interesting question because there's so many, there's so many different uh, perspectives, I think, you know, uh, coming from that. But I think, I think culturally, I think we, in, in some weird ways, we identify with creatures because, you know, we always treat creatures as like enemies of, of us, right? It's always, you know, they're always the undesirables or whatever. And I think maybe this is getting a little bit deep, but I think a lot of us have that feeling like we don't fit in, you know, we're misfits in some way. And I think because of that, we I think we, we tend to sympathize with monsters more. And, and you know, even whether we were consciously aware of it or not, I think that's part of why we relate to it so much and our fascination with it so much. That's, that's at least five. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, I mean, it's, it, it, it might, that might explain you know, the success of a film like E.T. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, I don't know if that was the first, well, I guess really Planet of the Apes is the first time when you had a creature that is no longer treated as an other. Yeah. Where it's, you know, it, and it's, it's, the first one's a comedy. It's a whole, that's a really interesting series to, to like do a commentary on in general. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, was there, like, do, do you think that there was a, a shift in, the business as well from the early days where creatures were you know bad guys like the creatures were bad right mm -hmm. uh and then at some point they became like us the misfits for example and then maybe it's you know uh society is the one that's keeping them down maybe it's us that is, that is the problem mm -hmm. um have you ever pondered that um yeah i mean to, to some degree because I, I think like you know if you look at some a classic like frankenstein right there, there's a lot of pathos in that in that character, and you know the, the whole tragedy of how he became and and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's actually quite sad. And but yet, if, if you look at how we collectively as, as a civilization 
treat misfits, it really speaks about who we are as a civilization, like how we treat animals in general, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very much like an animal act, rights activist. And, and so I don't, I don't eat animals. I don't, you know, I don't, I just, I don't do that kind of stuff. But then when I talk to other people and see what their take on it, and I totally get it because I used to be like that as well before I kind of, I kind of woke up to the idea that, Hey, what we're doing is not right. This is not, this is not justice. You know? And so I think it's really very much a, a human nature thing where we, we tend to want to treat things. We, we have to put ourselves above certain people, certain things or whatever in order to, to elevate ourselves so we don't become victimized. I think our fear of being victimized is so huge. We tend to want to rather be the aggressors and be okay with that. And so I think that's really all kind of a, a running theme for our civilization. And I think that's why, you know, the monster, the whole monster culture is kind of, you know, it's all sort of interrelated, intertwined. Well, that's a really interesting take on that. Uh, do you find that same theme running true in, say, Japan? Um, I want to say universally, it probably runs through in, in most cultures. Like, you know, like I said, I think the key here is whether or not they're conscious of it. I think it happens, you know, and, and of course, some cultures celebrate monsters more than others. Like for instance, as a kid growing up, you know, I love all the Japanese, you know, monster movies and stuff. But I, when I grew up in Taiwan, before I moved away, the Taiwanese government had an aversion to monster sci-fi fantasy. You know, if it's Kung Fu Monkey King is fine. But if it's a Japanese monster movie or Japanese giant robot fighting monsters, they they find that to be, they treat it as a bad thing, like it's brainwashing kids to believe in nonsense. And I remember there was a movie called Red Baron that was on the theaters and the, the government literally went in there and shut it down in the middle of the screening because they said this was bad for kids. Um, and so they, they shut it down and they, they, they prohibited the movie from being shown. Uh, even to my surprise, you know, as a kid, I'm, I'm like, you know, what, seven, eight years old, and I'm going, what's wrong with this? This is fun stuff, you know? But again, I think there was this whole, and, and culturally, I believe, you know, at least the Chinese government, you know, or this was in Taiwan, or not even China, but in Taiwan, I think there's a, a running theme that they don't want to pollute your mind with nonsense. Like, you should be a doctor, or a lawyer, or an engineer, or do something serious with your life. And I think that's the big difference between, between like, Chinese Taiwan culture versus Japanese culture because in Japan they do embrace monsters like they do embrace the idea of superheroes and all that kind of fun stuff they, they know what it is it's not it's not bad it doesn't do it. that's really interesting because both Taiwan and Japan were arguably U.S. satellite states after World War II and have very different rules surrounding media it seems like Japan was very lax Taiwan seems to have been very fairly strict do you think yeah. that, do you think that the, the Taiwanese, I mean, I should say in a sense, it's originally Chinese. We're not talking about Aboriginal Ch Taiwanese beliefs here. We're talking about Chinese beliefs yeah. originally. Yeah. Do you think that the government was concerned about children identifying with these misfit characters, these monsters? Um, I don't know if... That was their concern. I, I want to say, and I'll cite another example, because I think what they wanted to do was they wanted the kids to be educated in a way that would make them patriotic and make them useful to society. And the example I, I would cite is that there was a Monkey King animation, right? Uh, and it, they translated it into, into Chinese, into Mandarin. And you know, I watched it growing up. And the end song at the end was, him singing the song was about how much he loves school, how much he loves to be educated, how much he loves all the stuff. And it's Monkey King. It's very right? G.I. Joe, isn't it? Yeah. And as a kid, I never thought about it. But then as an adult later, and I was talking to somebody, a Japanese friend of mine, I said, Oh, you know, I used to watch that show in Indiana. And I said, The end song, was this about how much he loved school? He goes, No, it was the opposite. It's about how much he hated school. He hated all this being held down and, and, and being restricted. And I thought, Aha, that's the difference there. You know, culturally, the Taiwanese want the kids to be, grow up to be more indoctrinated, to become patriotic, and to care about the society and be responsible adults. And they, they view any fantasy influence as something that would work against that. And that's how they view it. Wow. So I think it was 
it's more about the element of, of you know learning adult responsibilities versus you know the other thing you're saying. Wow, so that's so interesting. I'm, I was thinking when I asked the question about Japan, I was thinking of Godzilla being sort of, I mean, in film school, the way that in film school language is that, you know, Godzilla is the sort of uh, undifferentiated other that comes from overseas and comes bearing nuclear power, represents both foreign aggression and this sort of like misfit part of society. Um, and yet, do you find that within Japanese culture, they they actually embrace these characters because they're showing them. They might be villains, but I mean, sometimes, sometimes the villains are our favorite characters, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think Godzilla is a very interesting one because if you watch the original Godzilla, you know, Godzilla was the result of a radiation of all the things that happened, and in in some ways, uh, it's been a long time since I, I've watched that original Godzilla, um, so I don't remember every little detail about it, but. But I remember the impression I got was that it was almost kind of a, it was kind of a metaphor for a big mistake that either a big mistake that they had made was what the story was. But, but I think for me, subtly, what they were, what they were equating to was that Nagasaki, right, in, in Hiroshima was bombed by the atom bomb. That really was the, their protest of you created, this is the monster you created and now it's here to destroy, you know. I think there was something more to do with that in a way that they're protest protesting quietly. Isn't isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. It's like uh it's political commentary yeah. couched as this kind of goofy sci-fi rubber suit. And mm -hmm. uh I mean arguably Plan 9 from Outer Space is the same thing in a sense, mm -hmm. right? Where you have these aliens coming and telling the US government like, "Hey, look, uh if you guys don't, you know, Basically, if you guys don't make a UN, you're going to kill each other. Is basically what, it's kind of what that movie's about, right? Um, yeah. Because we've done that over here, right? Um, yeah. and, and that line, you humans are stupid. Stupid, stupid. <laughs> I mean, who can argue with that, right? They yeah, yeah. It's a, that's one way of looking at people. Again, and and I'm, I'm thinking now about the original King Kong, too, in America, where, you know, you, you have a... Uh, you have a time period where there is this sort of um, debate between people who think that, uh, you know, chimpanzees are our ancestors and a side of society that says, like, no, chimpanzees are uh, lower than humans. Maybe there's like this representation of the quote unquote savage from Africa attacking and taking our women. Right. There's these sort of two schools of thought that are, well, they're doing this. They're not doing this. They never did this. They're doing this. Um, uh, like what's your read on, that was my read on King Kong. What's yours? On King Kong? <clears throat> wow. You hit me with a lot of tough ones today. Sorry. I, I'm now I'm, now I'm interested in, in creatures suddenly. Uh, you got me yeah. interested. Yeah. I, you know, honestly, I never really thought much about King Kong other than there was just a lot of similarities between King Kong and a lot of the other monster movies that came out afterwards. And for me, you know, I think because of because of my personal take on, you know, the animal abuse thing about humanity tend to tend to elevate themselves above everybody else. Like there's a sense of sense of pride, a sense of superiority complex, but also I think that complex comes from this need for self preservation, and and you know the big thing that I always got from it uh, from that that perspective was that they're always creating enemies. Right, you're always creating situations where there's something that is perceived as bad, and we, as the hero, have to take it down. And you know, I, all the way down to even you know natives, you know, abducting the women and whatnot. So, you know, that that's I I always kind of get a sense of that. Like, why do we always have to fight monsters? Why, why do we have to create monsters? Like, right? I, I always come from the kumbaya <laughs> side of things, where like, why can't we have to create monsters that are beautiful and you know, and, and they're different and we just, we accept them and we learn to live with them, and, you know, whatever. So, so my take might be a little bit more black and white, but it's always like, we just create more enemies to fight, create more conflicts to, to display our superiority. Um, and I don't think that's healthy. You know, I think that's, that it's, anytime you marginalize any group, either people or animals or anything, I don't think it's healthy. I don't think it's good for, for us as a civilization. 
Yeah, you know, there's definitely, um, I mean, there's a difference between marginalization and conservation, for example, right? Like there is, there are, you could think of yourself as superior in the sense of I get to own all this and destroy it at my will. I'm kind of God over this thing. And there's also the, the shepherd mindset where, look, uh, I own this land. There are animals on this land. I'm going to protect them as much as possible. Um, so it's, it's, it's that mindset of, well, because we, because we're better, we can destroy it. We can use it however we want that. That's what you're talking about. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm not talking about, I mean, obviously, you know, a lot of the animals, especially ones that are going extinct benefits from conservation benefits from us interfering to conserve them. Um, and I'm all for that. I'm not, I'm not opposed to that at all, but it's, but you know, like you might say, my, my view of humanity is, tend to be a little bit more on the negative side only because we see so much negativity on the news and we don't get to see that the majority of the world is actually good. Well, that's your you know? problem, Steve, is you're watching the news. I know. It sucks. You got to <laughs> stop watching the news, man. You're missing all the good stuff. Yeah. But then I watch, I do watch a lot of good stuff too because I have to, I have to balance myself out. Because I, I, I do know it's not all negative. Oh, I'll give you a shameless plug is a good news, good news, only prints good news, um, yeah. which is why they can't make a single dime. <laughs> Who's going to really? advertise on that? Exactly. No, no one wants to see good yeah. news. Everybody wants to see, you know, like one of the things I absolutely hate is I hate talk shows that uh, like the Jerry Springer shows, you know, like those kind of shows where they bring people up and then say, oh, by the way, your daughter is going to be a stripper for the first time on, on stage live in front of America. And, the, and they have the father there, like, begging her not to do it. Right. And then she does it, and the father's humiliated. And, and you know, it's like, and then, you know, or you're you're carrying my baby, you know, and you're finding out for the first time. I mean, like, I hate that kind of stuff because a lot of people really find that entertaining. And they, and they I, I don't know for whatever reasons, I'm sure there are, there are a whole gamut of reasons why people love that stuff. But I don't find that stuff to be entertaining. I, I, I know I, the last thing I ever want to see anybody do is to be humiliated you know I, I can't watch that stuff it drives me nuts like you know i want i want to see people succeed i want to see them do well like when people i know do well i'm so happy for them you know like it it's when i see people humiliated like i can't support that i can't yeah. watch this I yeah can't. i think jerry springer is almost is an example of like um like if i were to put that in, a, in the context of like the gladiator fight where you're you're cooking up a match every day um and uh, every now and then maybe every day you have to bend you know bend reality a little bit and maybe cast some people who are better actors than others mm -hmm. and uh there what do you think it is about us here's a here's a very philosophical question the audience loves this garbage we know that they love it otherwise it wouldn't exist there wouldn't be ads mm -hmm. They love violent news. They love this. They love they love the war in Ukraine. Like people love the war in Ukraine. It's so entertaining, right? Do you think that this is the animal in us, or do you think that this is the human part of us? Wow. I'm hitting well, you with the hardest questions I think I've ever hit anybody on this podcast. I would posit to say that the human is the animal. You know? I don't think there's a difference because because I think the reason why we would frame a question like that, if I, if I may, is that we view ourselves above the animal. That's why we, we always go, oh, if you're, if you're acting like an animal, you're doing something like that. If you're acting like a human, you're civilized, right? But I would say that if you take that equation out, uh, which, which I do, like I don't view humans or animals any different in terms of we're all created equally as beings on this planet. It's our intelligence level, our, our language, you know, things that we do that would be deemed technically like we're superior than they are, but, or because we're more intelligent. But being more intelligent doesn't mean we're smart. That's the big difference. You know, you, you look at something like the, the, the founder of uh, OpenAI, you know, he, there's been a lot of concern about AI having the ability to eventually destroy humanity. You know, the, the, the founder of AI was asked, well, do you believe that what you are creating here will eventually have the ability to destroy civilization? And he says, absolutely. But he chose to go ahead and develop it anyway. And that is that is the human thing, you know? And and so it's, it's 
for me, I, I don't feel there's any difference between humans and animals. I believe we're the same. We're just another form of animal or animals are just another form of humans, however you want to look at it. So I don't, I don't, I don't see that difference at all. I think that is just intrinsically us. Hmm. Do you think then that maybe the reason people see humans as different is sort of like twofold? Uh, one is the positive, which is language. We're able to talk through our differences. We're able to communicate using an extremely complex language that goes beyond just dialogue. It goes into these podcasts, it's contracts, it's government institutions, right? We have these incredibly complex linguistic structures, uh, which allow us to put violence behind us and work through these problems, right? This is the stuff that news doesn't want to show you. Um, those might be the humanist optimists versus the the other side of it, which is that, look, animals are violent, yes, but humans are able to wipe out the entire planet with a nuke. So you have these sort of like two, <clears throat> two superpowers that, look, there's debate about whether or not animals have language, but um, as far as we know, animals don't create contracts on paper with pen, right? They don't, they don't have that kind of contract or that kind of linguistic ability, nor have they made nukes. <laughs> and we have both of them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. Well, yeah. And another thing to think about too, you know, like I know, like animals, they they kill and they eat each other, and it's not the most like painless experience for the other animal that's being eaten. I think they've even gone as far as to kill them in certain ways that are we would consider extremely brutal. But I'll tell you, I've never seen an animal do to another animal as horrifying as what a human has done to another. We're very creative in how we. We do that um and that's we're, we're so creative that we actually will give it to somebody else to do yes yeah but you look at you look at war and all the atrocities that happen in war you look at serial killers and, and people that do the most horrific things that i can't even imagine you know how they come up with that kind of stuff but they're humans they're not animals you know animals re mostly react to instinct like maybe some animals are, are more evolved that they might do a few little things that are a little that could be considered more human or a little bit more fucked up maybe uh, I know that has definitely has happened. It's not the norm, but it has happened. Especially if they have uh, hands. Yeah, exactly. But it, but nothing compares to what humans do to other humans yeah. or do to other animals. I mean, it's it's horrible. Yeah. So I, I've always I've always viewed the human as the monster. There's no worse monster on the planet than that. Only because we have the capability to, to to do the worst atrocities and we're creative. You know, I'm not saying all humanity is bad, but human has the potential to do global way yeah i mean that, that is kind of this like paradox of being a, a, a human and i promise we'll get to like the the fun you know drive and govern giver questions in just a minute but like i i like the i like this part of the podcast personally i think this is like where we get into people's heads mm -hmm. uh that is that sort of paradox about humanity is that yeah we can go both ways and perhaps i mean that's always the decision right like do we make a nuke or do we or do we sign a treaty? Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps what is the human condition is that we have this difficulty in deciding, right? And like, let's be fair, we tend to go towards the treaty. We tend, you know, like for all the amount, the amount of news of the number of wars, you have to bear in mind that the other 211 countries are not at war. Mm -hmm. Or maybe 209 at this point are, only, are not at war. There are quite a few at war. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot of war right now. There's been a lot of war for the past 20 years. But, uh, but, the, but the fact that we, we tend to go this way, um, I think that that makes some people optimistic. Um, but then also the fact that we sometimes go this way toward the nuke or towards warfare or to just slaughtering women and children mm -hmm. or anybody. A life is a life, right? Yeah. Um, we go in that direction. Uh, you know, I guess, is that possibly what makes humans different from animals? Or is there is there something within animals that you see that also has this sort of bifurcation? Or are animals sort of free from that? They don't have to worry about this. Um, I don't think that's entirely true. Um, because I know, I know I've, I've read some articles about chimpanzees, you know, how they hunt as a group and they, they hunt smaller monkeys and they have plans and how they do it. 
and sometimes how they do it is pretty brutal, you know. Um, but but I think the big difference right now, and and I'm no you know I'm not an expert on this, so just just strictly my opinion. But I feel like animals have less choice of going one way or the other. I think they still more or less function off of nature, off of how they were born, how they were programmed, you know, to function. Like, why do why do dogs when they're born, you know, they already know how to do certain things. Like certain animals already know how to do certain things instinctually. It's born programmed into their DNA. So I don't think animals make those kind of choices mostly. Whereas, you know, as humans, we do. We have to make those make those choices. Um, I mean, if you want to get really crazy, I, I'll tell you what I really believe. You know, let's get crazy. I love crazy. Let's do it. Yeah, I believe in the concept of reincarnation. I believe in the concept of eternal souls. Like we are all just souls, eternal. We exist. The human form is just a third density version of us that we we live here. We're here to play a part of our soul contract. We go through life the way we, I kind of planned as part of a a, a less. Right, and we we do this over and over again for for thousands of years, or maybe forever. You know, we're constantly incarnating into different life forms, and we're just learning and learning to become uh, whatever it is we're supposed to become. Whether it's another God self, or it's, it's what, what. But I believe this is why you know I've always had a, an issue with the idea of of evolution uh, and ascension, to some degree, because I looked at I look at the planet, you know as a, a school you know and all everything that we experience here the good and the horrific the wars and then also you know like like the, the times of peace and love and all that stuff i believe that's all part of the curriculum on this planet and the reason that i i feel like us as humans have not really evolved that much and i don't mean physical evolution like from monkey to human i'm talking about a mental spiritual evolution um I feel like we as human beings have not changed since like, you know, 20,000, 30,000 years ago, whatever we became modern man, right? I, I feel that we have not really changed. Uh, and, and the reason that I say that is because if you wanna see how devolved we can get and go back to savages, all you have to do is tomorrow, turn off all the electricity, all the power and the food infrastructure for a month in any city and watch them rip themselves apart. It's happened, so it happened with COVID and everyone was very yeah. upset. Exactly, right? So we haven't really evolved. We're still that same savages. All we have now is just more laws that keeps us in check and say, if you do this, there's, like, there's consequences. That's why I keep people in check. So that's why I feel like we, we haven't evolved really all that much. So, but I feel like we're not supposed to evolve. I feel like this is a state of being. We come in for some time during our soul evolution to come to live these lives, to learn these lessons, to live through all the good, all the love, all the bad, the wars and the atrocities so that we all as souls can experience the full gamut of the human experience. So if you're gonna do that, you can't change the curriculum. And the curriculum is, the, is earth, earth is the school. And we're just passing through over and over again to take these different lessons classes throughout time. That's how kind of how I see it's it's, it's an interesting take on um you know there were people debating darwin at the time um mm -hmm. of course when you know darwin darwin's origin of species is actually anything but the origin of species <laughs> he, he, it's mostly just questions about how species generate uh when you read it you re you realize that what he's trying to figure out is the origin of species that's what he's trying to figure out so it, it's it's sort of in line with like his um detractors at the time who were saying that like species were stable um and that they were saying not him but like, we don't quite know what he thought exactly about that i think he thought that humans were evolving in fact that was a very common sentiment at the time and you know especially in victorian england where you know a lot of anthropologists are going out and they're 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 finally now able to survey you know aborigines in australia uh who are still technically in the stone age um and they're you know they're surveying they're getting surveys from native americans africans and uh not all of them but a lot of them viewed them as literally i think uh, uh i can't remember his name but there were there were eugenicists who thought that these people were less evolved like they were closer to chimps than people uh mm -hmm. and that 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 really fueled a lot of like horrible viewpoints at the time 
And what I what I appreciate about your perspective, and I I tend to share it um, regarding you know people, is that like back then we were also the same as those people, <laughs> mm -hmm. and you know your Europeans were also the same as those people, and you know you know Chinese were also the same as Aboriginal uh, Taiwan Taiwanese Aborigines, and Japanese were also the same as the Ainu, right? And none of these have good track records, by the way. <laughs> there are no good track records regarding you know like empire groups coming into uh you know native groups and the interactions that happen uh, but what i appreciate about that view is that and i think maybe it's i i i hope that you know with what you're saying um if if what you're you know going through this life what we try and leave behind is this idea of like no like we are all people there aren't grades of people and that you know maybe the the monstrous other is what is possible within us if we fall victim to this mindset that some of us are better than others right yeah yeah and the idea of, of strength too you know people have such differing views on what it is to be a strong person you know some people view being a strong person as having the ability to conquer and take control and victimize uh, my view of a strong person is always you know, if you're a strong person, your job is to protect and to protect the weak. You know, um, it's not easy being a righteous strong person. It's harder to be that kind of a strong person than to be somebody who conquers and do whatever for selfish reasons. So I think these are all things that, that at some point, you know, as a human being, you really should investigate and come to terms with and make a decision for yourself what kind of person you want to be. And you know, and that's why, and sometimes I don't think one lifetime is enough to, to learn that kind of lesson. For some people, they need a few lifetimes at least to kind of learn these lessons. That's why I think this school, this earth is a, is a curriculum, it's a school. And I think that, I mean, regardless of one's views, I think everybody would agree that what we need to leave behind is a legacy of trying to improve things and leave things yeah. better than the way that, well, it, it, at least take the campers mentality where like, just pick up your garbage before you leave. <laughs> Uh, at least do that, right? Like try not to try not to kill anybody. At least um, be like animals. Animals don't litter. No, no, they they don't. They're very good. I mean, unless they get our stuff, then they litter like mad. But uh, it's our, it's stuff. our stuff. The litter. Yeah. So uh, when it comes to designing creatures, then so you have this, you have this this view that you said that humans have this have like a broader choice than say a chimp and a chimp more so than a call this monkey more so than a, you know, than an iguana. Um, when you're making, when you're designing monsters and when you're imagining these things and when you're crafting them, where do you put them on that scale? Right. Do you put them kind of in that same kind of human free will slash, or I guess like linguistic and, it just, I think that, you know, what we do mostly when we design creatures, we, we serve the script, the, the greater purpose of what it's for. So if it comes in the form of a, a movie, let's say, right, they would put the, the, the writers, you know, would put in the script, or oh, what's, this, what's this monster going to do, or whatnot. Um, and so a lot of that would already pre-establish where that monster is. You know, it's a, if it's a, just a big blabbering, gooey, frothing at the mouth creature that does nothing but kill. Well, we kind of know what that is. That's just sort of low on the totem pole of intelligence. Then you get into, you know, characters like E.T., where obviously he's an extraterrestrial and he's smarter. So then, you know, uh, we, we put all those elements into the mix so that, okay, if it's an intelligent character, there's a certain way we design intelligence. And we see a lot of the intelligence, not only in the behavior, but also in the eyes. The eyes is a, a key, because you can make a, a creature look completely soulless the right kind of eye design or you can make them the most intelligent with the right kind of eyes so you know there, there are certain sort of things that we follow already that's very well known uh ways of designing creatures and then what you do with that from that point on is just kind of whatever comes to comes to mind that fits the script fits the setting steve why do you think they put human like eyes on Disney characters and animals and whatnot when animal eyes are actually very different looking than human eyes. Because we can, it's hard for us to make that connection with with uh, animals in that in that respect. For instance, if you look at all the Disney characters, 
they're all really exaggerated. They all have intelligence like humans. They all speak. Even if they don't speak, they behave like humans, you know, exaggerated cartoon humans. So that's a very common thing to do. You 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 do it in the eyes. For instance, like Little Mermaid, like the animation, when Ariel couldn't speak, right, for the time she was on, on dry land, you saw her, she was always emoting through her eyes, through her body language. Essentially, she's doing what those the other animals would be doing. You know, in, in how she pantomimes stuff. So that was just that's just a very simple convention uh, of, to do is just to make them more like us, so we can relate to them. Um, all right, we had a question here about Giver. Um, actually, Benny Mamashiro is asking, uh, "What's your favorite monster?" My favorite monster is the creature from the Black Book, the original one, uh, nineteen fifty. That monster changed my mind. I think it gave me a fascination with aquatic creatures, which then I've had the opportunity to do a bunch in my career. You know, I, I get to do the Monster Squad Gilman, I get to do Ape Sapien for Hellboy. Um, I just have a natural you know, uh, inclination and, and love for aquatic creatures. Did you, um, did you have a love for the, the, the water, the ocean before that as well? Uh, no, I hate the ocean. Me too. Hate it. <laughs> let me let me let me should get rid of it. I fear the ocean. The ocean is a force of nature that should not be messed with. Um, you know, and it's 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 intimidating as hell. Um, you know, I appreciate the ocean. I love what the ocean does for us. You know, I love all the life forms in the ocean, but I can stay away from it just fine. Yeah, me too. In fact, I never understood the beach. Um I hate the beach. <laughs> you know, I never used to hate the beach until I shot Kung Fu Rasp. Oh, okay. I was at the beach for about two months on weekends to shoot that big end scene with the giant war gods fighting each other. And my God, there was sand in our food, sand in my hair, in my eyes, in my clothes, in my car that I track home. It was sand everywhere. And it was, and then I really learned to not like it at all. <laughs> well, you learned well. <laughs> yeah. The only time I go to the beach is when my wife and I take our dogs to the dog beach. And I love it when they, I, we go there because my dogs are such a great Yeah. It's much easier easier to enjoy the beach when somebody else is enjoying it. I agree. Yeah, exactly. It's not a place I would go by myself. I don't. I just can't relax there. I don't know what it is. Like, I just, mm -hmm. I'd rather just go like 100 feet back that way and then yeah. look at the beach. Uh, JJ Hayden says, hi, Steve. Thanks for Hello, your work. I noticed in Giver 2 that some choreography and shots look the same as some in Operation Scorpio. Did Anthony Hoke have anything to do with that? Um, refresh my memory. What's Operation Scorpio again? Operation Scorpio is 1990 Lao Galarang movie with uh, Kim Won Jin. Kim Won Jin is this kind of like spry Korean dude. He's like 5'2". And he does mm -hmm. these really acrobatic moves, and he does this cool scorpion pose where he goes on all fours, except he lifts one leg up into this kind of scorpion position. Oh, okay. I, I don't remember seeing that movie, but I know I know the movie you're talking about. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm I don't know because you know that the choreography was done by Koichi Sakamoto in Alpha Stunts, uh, yeah, Tetsuro Koike and Yuji uh, Akihiro Noguchi, and so you know. We're basically all just big kung fu movie fanboys, and we made that, you know, first making a movie like that. It wasn't like we're really making a real movie. We're like a bunch of geeks out there, let's make kung fu movies, you know. Um, so it's very possible that could have been uh, an influence or inspiration for sure. But I, I can't speak for those guys because a lot of times they'll choreograph something I've never seen before, and I go, oh, that's cool, let's do it. So yeah, so uh, honestly, I'm not quite sure, but it, it could be. Did they ever? Um... We probably talked about this in the episode, but um, did they give um, camera shot ideas too for their choreography? Um, sometimes, sometimes. Um, yeah, I don't know. Koichi was only 23 when I made it, and I was actually only 27 when I made Guyver 2. And we were, you know, he he had he had made some of his own like college yakuza movies, you know, uh, that they were kind of fun. And then uh, I had only made a couple couple of movies, and so I'm pretty much, you know, Guyver 2, to me, I was still kind of a newbie making movies. Um, and so when it comes to shooting action, I think that was the film that I started, it started to click. 
like I wasn't still, I wasn't like fully natural at it yet, you know, but somehow as we're choreographing and stuff and I'm watching it and I'm kind of like getting ideas on how we can shoot this, um, it started to, to come. So every so often Koichi would say, hey, I think we look good if we put the camera over here. Like, okay, oh yeah, let's look at it. You know, it was more, more suggestions every so often, but he wasn't all that involved with the camera placements so much on, on Guyver 2. Uh, and on drive, even less, because at that point, uh, he really just trusted me to, to shoot it however way. Because he and I have a very different shooting style. We watch his movies, right, the ones he made, like his, the way he shoots action, the way I do it, very different. And I camera camera operate on my own action as well. So, you know, so I'm just very, very specific about how I like to shoot things. Um, but what, what we have done a lot uh, of is when the choreography is done and we're, get, we're shooting it, they move it. Sometimes we say, oh, you know what, we have a problem cutting this into this. So the coach will say, you know, what if we do a, a pickup or, or an insert of this? Like, oh yeah, okay. So we're kind of editing the movie as we go, uh, as we're shooting it. So in that way, it was very collaborative because he also knows how to shoot and edit action. So we were speaking the same language. Like we can see the fight already in our mind, fully edited. So we're shooting to how it comes. Very cool. Yeah. Um... The uh, the drive film made a big impact on a lot of us, I think. Um, somebody's asking, uh, this is Alexis Mazzani? Mazzanti, excuse me. I would have loved a drive sequel. Why did it never happen? Oh my God, that, that is a very long story. Um, no, we would have too. I know Mark, the Costco's, Kadeem Hardison, everybody wanted to do a sequel. I want to do it, Scott Phillips, the writer. Koichi, um, we tried to make it happen, but the big problem was that after I finished the movie, I had a big falling out with the investor um, from Overseas Film Group. Um, and there were just a lot of bad things that happened. They took the film away from me. That's why there's that the alternate shorter cut that's floating around that came out before my cut. And when you have something so close to your heart as you're making a movie, somebody just takes it away from you. And tell you they're gonna make a better movie out of it, you know, and you're, you're just kind of kept out of it. It's really something I would not wish any of my worst enemies to have to experience. It's really heartbreaking and really tough. And so, because of that, um, and I found that it was all based on a lie on top of all that, a few years later. Uh, again, it's too complicated for me to get into, and I don't wanna talk bad about anybody. You know, it was just, it's what it was. It was just a bad time in my life uh, before the film came out. And so because of that, I didn't have a, a relationship with the guy. Uh, he had the rights to it and, you know, just could it just wasn't, good. this wasn't good. So yeah. I would love to have made a, a sequel because Drive was kind of an incomplete story. You know, we, we got it to a certain point where, okay, now they're going to head to LA. They were trying to get to LA, but they never got there. <laughs> Cause it's like the movie was too long. We ran out of money, you know? Okay. So, um, so it would be nice to see what happened when they got to LA. And, and all the all the zany madness that ensues. Maybe thirty years later they make it. Yeah, they could they could be in wheelchairs, you know. Hey, come back here. <laughs> yeah, kind of a Boba Hotep style uh, action film. Well, you know, I, I always had a joke about Kung Fu Rascals. People were saying, "Would you ever make a Kung Fu Rascal sequel?" I'm like, "Now, you know, we're all kind of like you know, fifties and sixties." I'm like, "Sure, here's how the fight scene would go in Kung Fu Rascals. We're sitting at a you know, we're sitting against across from each other in a wheelchair." And say, oh yeah, now if I could actually punch, I would do a roundhouse kick to you and then do a spinning back and then a, a, a arm combination against you. And the other guy would say, oh yeah, then I would block it with, and you just talk about how we're going to fight. <laughs> you could have, so you could have some people show that, you know, but uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. they could be, yeah, you can do it. Yeah. We'll put you in the costume and you can do it. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm young. -ish. Hey, you're pretty, you're pretty freaking good, man. I, I'm very impressed by your martial arts ability and everything you've done so thanks man yeah yeah uh let's see we got some more questions here um benny mamashiro asks again what's your favorite fight scene that you've ever been involved in oh huh and you know i never really thought about that i think i just kind of like we just shoot the fight scenes and we enjoy watching it i know there are like there are moments in in fights, like, you know, for instance, like one of my favorite moments in Drive um, was the scene where, uh, it's, I, I think I said this in the commentary, where it's in the, the Apollo 14 bar and the advanced model and Mark had already started fighting. And there's one bit where he, 
they come in and, and the advanced models doing the spin and the guy Mark does the you know the, the back hip up and then he finally kicks him in the face and the camera comes in like there was like little little tidbits throughout certain fight scenes that I think just came together so beautifully and really really inspired me to feel like oh I'm actually creating something worthy of like all the Hong Kong movies that I watched growing up you know because a lot of those movies especially in the 80s were done with so much style like the like the the once upon a time in China movies you know and there's Hong Sai Yuk and all these movies that were so beautifully choreographed, sh shot and edited. And I feel like there was a, definitely some moments in Drive where I felt like we were able to attain that level, you know, here and there. Um, but you totally cool, attained it, man. You, you, you nailed it, 100%. Oh, cool. 100%. Oh, thank you. A lot of credit goes to Koichi. His team, they're fantastic. You know? I think we, we collaborated very well. Despite, um, but yeah, but, um, you know, as far as full fight scenes, I think... I think the garage fight was was pretty fun, you know. I think I think my, my biggest problem always is because you make it a low budget movie, right? You never have time to shoot a fight scene properly. So the way we pulled it off in drive was we I, I talked to producers and letting us shoot second shifts and weekends and and then I just didn't sleep, we just go around the clock. And that gave us a much better chance to to shoot the fight scenes that we did, which was kind of unheard of for low budget films. You, you just don't get that kind of time to do it. Um, so, but uh, but again, I think usually as a filmmaker, I, I always come back and look at it and go, oh man, I, I wish we could have ended the fight this way or ended like that because ultimately it's still storytelling. It's still telling a story even through the fight. And I feel like sometimes we don't quite hit the mark with ending a certain fight properly um, or it doesn't quite hit certain notes that it should hit. But again, I'm just being picky here. Um, I think overall, everybody did a great job and I'm just... Sometimes I'm still very surprised that we were able to pull off that movie. Yeah, so. yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an awesome, it's an awesome showpiece. Were you, uh, were you inspired by Terminator Two when you were doing Terminator Two? Funny you ask. You know, my wife and I just watched that uh, on Fourth of July actually, um, because you know my dogs are so afraid of the fireworks, and so we we usher them to the home theater, cranked up Terminator Two, tried to distract them, and we just sat there with just. To, to kill time and we ended up like oh oh i forgot how good this and how fun this movie was um yeah i love terminator 2 it's such a such a cool movie the, the stunts and all the practical effects they did and everything it's like you know it really speaks of cameron's genius and how he approached the movies yeah. and the the combat between the two machines also i think mm -hmm. as when i was watching drive you know at the end at the end you have machine versus machine and you know there's the sunglasses and there's the very kind of mechanical movements i was wondering if there was any inspiration there that snuck in um not not exactly from terminator 2 but it's funny thing because that that's a very common theme that would come up in in films that i make like guyver 2 had the same thing you know you have the two equals fighting each other um and then and, and a few other scripts that i've written that never got made all kind of had that same theme um and i to the point where i'm feeling like ah, i feel like i'm making the same movie again i really need to change this up a little bit but but again, what you know, I mean, what would you expect, right? You look at any of the, the Marvel movies and you gotta have a worthy adversary, whether he, he comes from the same background as you or he's somebody more, he's gotta be more, more powerful than you to make a worthy fight, you know? Um, but, um, but as far as inspiration, um, yeah, I think the inspiration was just from really wanting to try to create as cool a fight as we can. Like the funny thing is like that whole sunglasses thing, I wrote that into the script um, and I just kind of wrote like, oh, then he throws his sunglasses in a really cool way. He does his thing and then it snaps. And they, I remember the morning we we're shooting this and the producer, Mike Lee, came up to me and goes, oh, this is the morning you're shooting that sunglass gag, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, how are you going to do it? And I was like, I have no idea. Um, but we'll figure it out. We always figure it out. And so we shot it. You know, like we, Koichi and I talked about it. We did a few things. I had props or rig a thing to break, you know, he was hiding behind it to like, okay, at this point you pull it, this thing breaks. And then, so we kind of just hopped it out and he tried a few things and, you know, and I just said to him, I said, you know, I want to show something, this might be a little crazy and I don't know if people will get it, but I wanted to show them that stick comes up so fast and it stops so quickly and abruptly that it's the force that it generates that actually penetrates and breaks sunglasses. Cool. We added a little effect on there yeah. just to show a little moving thing. I said, I don't know if people will get it, but Fuck it, let's just do it, you know. Yeah. And so we shot it, put it together, and I thought it worked pretty well. But to this day, I've never asked anybody if they actually got that. That's what happened. 
Did you get that? That's yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what. Oh. That's exactly how I saw it. I mean, it was okay. very clear. I mean, it's yeah. like you're you're just doing you're doing a kung fu movie. You're you're making a kung fu movie with robots, and like that was that moment. Like you're saying, like you're making something special here, right? You took yeah. you took you know Terminator versus T one thousand, but you now are adding kung fu into it, mm-hmm. and you do yeah. this kind of chai, tai chi move. And it right. breaks the sunglasses, and yeah, I think we all got it, man. Okay, I never asked anybody because it was always clear in my head. But I'm like, you know, I never asked if anybody got that, or they just go, "What happened?" You know? Yeah, it was really cool. Uh, Solid Cloud is asking, was Guyver three ever on the table? It was on the table many times. Um, every attempt that I have made to get that film made has failed, uh, and most recently, about four or five months ago was the most recent. Uh, I've been pursuing this, trying it. I've talked to the creator of the Guyver. He's all behind it. But the biggest problem is, again, you make a movie and there's like rights issues where people aren't sure who owns what right and people are afraid to pull the trigger for fear of getting sued. It just, the rights of the Guyver just got so complicated. It's, it's beyond me, you know? And my last contact that I talked to about four or five months ago had a direct line to Kadokawa, who's the current rights holder to the Giver for any future Giver stuff. And he told me that yeah, he's known this person for 20 something years. And so he had really deep conversations with this person and basically came back and said, you know what? This is a problem that just can't be solved. It's the only way it can be solved. The studio comes in and say, I got a hundred million bucks and we'll make this movie. Anybody sues this, we'll handle it. That's the only way, yeah. which, you know, which I don't, I don't think a lawsuit would ever happen from a third party anywhere. They're talking about, and, I, and I've done all this research and I've presented them with all this evidence. And I basically said, anybody who would come back and claim any rights to the, the movie version of this has passed away, deceased, or disappeared off the face of the planet. No one can find them. They're gone. You know, it would never happen. But in Japan, they're so cautious. They just want to play it safe. And they basically just said, unless you have somebody with 100 million bucks that would protect this franchise from something like that, it's never going to happen. And so finally, like, I gave up and said, it's never going to happen. It's unfortunate. I had so many cool ideas for Guyver 3. Uh, I wanted to do like a Netflix series, like an eight episode thing. Um, and I have, you know, so many cool ideas for fight scenes for Guyver that I think fans would get a kick out of something really different and really fun, really complicated, but really fun. Uh, it's and unfortunate. Maybe I'll rework it to something in the future, but I don't know. I mean, I'm not even sure about if I'll ever make another movie. So it's kind of like, it'll, you know, it's, it's, it's... it's talking to Koichi. Um, he's got an interview. That will we'll premiere soon too, and he's talking about uh, talking with. Oh shoot! I might butcher what he says. There's a big difference. I actually don't remember which one was harder for him, but maybe you can elucidate on this a little bit. But Japanese Japanese copyright holders and studios are very different to work with than say American IP holders like Disney, for example. Mm-hmm. Now I might I might butcher this I might have to delete it later but my my memory was that he said that working with American companies Disney for example was much easier whereas Japanese uh, holders of copyright IPs and whatnot it's very difficult to get anything done. Mm-hmm. Um, well, it kind of goes down to it's really who you know. You know, if you know people that know people, it's a lot easier. Um, that's been my experience. Because, you know, I've dealt with Kadokawa directly. And yeah, it's been very difficult. And I could not get anything done. And even the people that I know who have it in there can get, can get it done. But I think this is this one specific property. Because there are so many unknowns, you know, involved. But, um, but as far as, like, you know, in Japan, like, I don't really know how things work in Japan. All I know is that they're very slow in getting things resolved. You know, when you contact them for stuff, it takes forever to get things going. That's why it's a matter of who you know. Like when I did Common Rider, um, I remember I was having a meeting with another producer, and then my friend uh, I was meeting with showed up early, and he was kind of just hovering in the background. I was like, "That's great. Let's, let's, let's and running him, you know, into him here." And then after my meeting, he came up to me and says, "Hey, it's got a quick thing to ask you." He says, "I'm going to Japan tomorrow. Um, you love Common Rider, right?" I said, "Yeah." He says, "If I can get the rights to it." You want to make a show and i was like fuck yeah i was like okay cool and he left and then two weeks later he came back and says all right we're doing it so he pulled it off somehow 
he found not only got the rights, he found the funding for it. And all, all I had to do was shoot a little test episode to show Toei Studios that we can do it. So with very little money, my brother and I, we went out and we put together a little crew. We shot a little teaser using some of their footage and some of our footage uh, of the basic premise of what, what we might be doing. Sent it over to Japan. They came back and <laughs> their answer was quite funny. They said, they came back with, we accept this. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, great. Let's do it. <laughs> it wasn't like, we love it. We hate it. We like it. We don't like it. We accept this. I'm like, okay, great. You know? You got to read between the lines. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I saw it as positive. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted great. to make sure we didn't butcher the, the franchise because they had a bad experience once with uh, Mass Player. Hmm. And they weren't, they weren't particularly happy. I think my only sadness about making Kamen Rider was that I had met the creator of Kamen Rider, Shotaro Ishinomori, years ago, when I was 21. And uh, and he was so nice to me, and, and you know, because I was a huge fan of Kamen Rider. And, and my only regret was not that he wasn't alive when I made my show, because I really made that show for him. You know, I wanted to show him that somebody from another country would take his show, kind of reboot it, reinvent it a little bit, but do it in the spirit of what he created and honor him, you know, in that way. Um, this is why I, I, stayed, I strayed away from the original concept, which was more like Highlander, you know, everyone for themselves. I say, you know, the thing that I love about common writers is the, the, the heroism, you know, their sense of loyalty to each other and friendship and all that stuff. And I said, that's, that was very important to me, the sense of right and wrong, you know, and, my, and this might sound very classic, very whatever, but but I think that was the, really the true spirit of common writer back then. So, uh, but at least the good thing was, you know, the, the producer and comedy writer, like the, the old time producer, Mr. Suzuki, who I, whom I met when I was doing the show early on, um, he came back afterwards uh, and actually through Koichi, told Koichi uh, that he was very impressed with the show and that he thought we did a great job. So I was very happy with That's that. That's great. <laughs> so. I think now's a good time to transition into our new segment, which is called How You See It. And, okay. uh, and the... Uh, um, Box uh, number two for 500. <laughs> <laughs> so we picked uh, a few action scenes beforehand. And uh, uh, last time we tried this with Johnny, uh, Johnny Young Bosch, I actually showed the clips and YouTube shut down the stream because um, they thought that I was pirating oh, videos. Right. So we're not going to show anything and that's fine. We can talk about it. It's actually probably quicker and more concise if we just talk from memory about these things. Um, so we picked uh, we picked some uh, classic films. We picked some new films, and we um, and we've already talked about Drive. Uh, let's let's focus on the ones that we picked, and then if we if we come back to Drive, or we can focus on something else you've done, like a Guyver scene, for example. Um, but I, I let's start with the uh, the classic fight that you picked which was sinbad versus kali in golden eight golden voyage of sinbad i'm going to put this in the chat so that people can actually watch this while we're talking uh this is from 1974 i'd never seen this until you sent it to me and okay man um uh, that is impressive yeah when did you first see this i saw this in the theaters um when i was a kid so i don't know that it was the First time it was released, I got a, it was, but it was in the seventies. I saw this, so it may have been the first time it was released. Um, and when that colleague showed up, it blew my mind because you know, especially after you understand how stop motion is done and how one man animated it frame by frame, and the way that the arms would oppose each other in perfect synchronicity and harmony, and look so beautiful as it's moving, and then it's fighting all these guys with six different swords. You know, and that's I think that was that was the brilliance of, of Ray Harryhausen. Because if you look at a movie like Jason and the Argonauts, where he has an army of skeletons, right, fighting a bunch of different actors, and he has to animate this one frame at a time, all five characters against people in a pre-choreographed fashion. That's a whole lot of stuff to keep in mind. And it's uh and so I don't I don't have any understanding of how somebody can do that other than he can do that. Yeah, I mean, what insight, having worked in the business, and maybe you've heard secondhand accounts of how this stuff was done, but what insight have you learned on how they actually pulled stuff like this off? Um, gosh, I don't, I don't think I've ever really asked 
anybody because I know I know a couple of stop motion animators, you know, and I know they have they have tricks, but I think one of the big tricks is isolation. <laughs> Once you get into it, you're in it, you know. You don't bother me, don't interrupt me, no phone calls, nothing, because if you even lose lose track of what you're doing at all, um, it's it's a disaster. You have to do it all over again. So I honestly don't know how they do it. And I never asked them, but I do know that, you know, if I had to do that and kind of trying to understand how I would try to break that down and do it, I just know that I can, it's, it's super complicated. It's difficult. Well, what's impressive about that scene is that, um, there's, there's obviously been a lot of forethought put into the performances. They, so yeah. they didn't have, they didn't have somebody behind the scenes and puppeting this thing. This is all done in post that, that, that Kali character is done entirely in post. Mm -hmm. And so you have, you know, they've detailed a fight. Somehow they've choreographed. I assume they choreographed a six armed person. I would think that would be the most logical thing to do that, that he brought in some people, they stacked together and he shot a bunch of stuff. Like, okay, let's try a bunch of stuff. I would love right, to see they... that previs, man. I would kill to yeah, see it. I, I, I don't know that maybe that exists, but I don't, like I said, I haven't delved into the making of that okay. deep enough to know if something like that actually happened, but logically thinking, you would imagine that must have happened, right? Because he didn't just he didn't just dream this out of his mind as he's doing it. Like you have to follow something. So I imagine that's probably the most logical course. He must have had a choreograph. He must have shot it, so he can frame by frame it, study it frame by frame, and then go. With it. I think maybe that's how he kept track, frame by frame. Hmm. He kind of copied it frame by frame. But again, there's still a lot of sort of emotionality in the moves too. There's, there's the, the, the change of momentum that he has to do. You know, there's a lot to consider because when you're doing it frame by frame, some people say, well, you can't goof up if you're going frame by frame, but I'm like, you can get lost in it. Horribly lost in it. So. It's incredibly time consuming. I mean, it, have you done, you've done stop motion before? Um, I have not. Well, no, I guess you could, it's, I've done it like, you know, for five seconds uh i used to be at one point in my life i wanted to be an animator like a 2d anime person and so it took only about 30 drawings to talk me out of it yeah i did a i did a, a thing of somebody like a pov of a spear coming towards the camera breaking through something at somebody's head and, and hitting them in the head it was only like a second and a half of, of frames and I, and I looked at it I was like oh this is fun and i'm like yep i'm never doing that again yeah that took me all year yeah <laughs> it's hard like you have to really love it to to do it like mine was more of a fascination oh maybe it's something i want to do but after doing it 30 drawings just talked me out like i'm no there's no way i can make this on the patient's for i mean it's sort of like the um i, I mean it's you, you are kind of talking about early green screen technology here where somehow you're i i, I don't know there's an optical process for putting you know, Kali on top of the frame. I think even Kali, some, I can't remember, but there might be moments where people actually cross in front of a sword as well. They might have even matted yeah. out. Yeah, they actually, that, that wasn't done on green screen. What they do is, um, oh no, I guess if they cross on top of, yeah, they would have to, they have to do green screen. But when, but a lot of times too, when they're, when the, the, the stop motion element is fighting the people, They'll shoot the plate of them doing this, and then they'll project that plate in the background, frame by frame, and they'll animate the, the stop motion in front of it and photograph it, so they can have them interacting. That's why you see a lot of side by side kind of stuff, you know. They do that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, awesome scene. Um, mm -hmm. Those are really. Um, I mean, when people watch this stuff today, do do people laugh at it? Because when I looked at it, I. I, you can see the you can see the hands behind it, you yeah. know. Like, do you think that is there a place for this? Still? I guess there is. I mean, people still make stop motion. Yeah. So stop motion during that time it was considered state of the art, you know, technology. Uh, it's no longer state of the art, you know, obviously. But now, what I love about stop motion is that it's now considered a boutique art form. So you look at stop motion animated film you know, like Night Before Christmas, you know, uh, James and the Giant Peach, like all those kind of Henry Selleck movies, you know, there's, it's become such an art form now that um, that it's appreciated on its own merits now. 
And I think that's one because what's what's tragic is if stop motion just stop existing. And I don't think it ever will. I think it'll always be a critique on it. It'll be like painting. You know, mm -hmm. it'll always be painting. Right. Um all right. That was a great scene. All right, next thing, next one you picked was the uh now we're getting into more modern work. Uh this is from Resident Evil Vendetta. This is a fight scene where Leon fights a hallway of zombies. And uh, I believe this was uh, Kinsuke Sonomura's. So when you first saw this, what did, what did you what did you see when you watched this scene? It was bliss. <laughs> it was for someone who likes to like. I have very like specific tastes when it comes to you know fight scenes that kind of stuff I prefer. You know, like whereas I appreciate all different styles of fights, fight scenes, and how they're shot, how they're choreographed. For me, the ones that I always it always resonates with me is when there is brilliant technique, there's a flawless execution of it, and there's a lot of thought behind how to take down an enemy quick, uh, but in a very pretty fashion, right? And then how it's and how it's performed and shot. And I feel like that scene hit all the marks, you know, the way that they would they would say they would use one shot per kill and rather than going bump 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 they would engage the enemy and move manipulate around it in a way that you know if they get bitten once it's over right they manage to always manipulate around that and get close enough to just take them out go to the next guy you know go to a couple guys at once and do this move around they snake through them in a very calculated fashion and i thought that was brilliant that was like that was like a really cool really well thought out zombie fight but also very beautiful to watch really effective and good impact and just like just overall, like I thought it was really unique when I first saw it. There's an interesting part of it too, where uh, it's the zombie acting. Mm -hmm. You know, I one of the things I mean, I'm very conscious of this when I watch zombie films is like I'm always looking for the motion capture actor behind the character, mm -hmm. and looking for stereotyped movements because I'm you know very critical about motion capture. Um, yeah. And there were a lot of moments where these zombies don't. I mean, they, they they don't really move like people. They move like they're dead. Um, yeah. Did you, what did you, I mean, what's your take on, on these zombies that they depicted? Um, It's been a long time since I've seen that. Like, I'm really just literally operating off, like, very limited memory of it. Um, So I can't really, I don't know if I can accurately answer that, only because I don't remember exactly. No, like, can you? How did, how, like, what was your impression of how did they move to you? Well, it just didn't seem like they, like, they didn't, um, they weren't smart. <laughs> right. Well, they're dead. Yeah. And, but it's like, how do you, how do you move like you're not smart as a person, right? In a mocap suit. And I, I always, yeah. I mean, I think about this all, every day of my life, I think about this. Like, okay, if I'm, if I'm a, if I'm an animal, if I'm a lizard, right? If I'm supposed to be a lizard character, how am I supposed to not move like a person? Right? I'm so mm -hmm. well-trained as a person. I've trained my whole life to be a person. Okay, how do I throw that away and now be this thing? And that's what you have to do with being a zombie. Well, I'll tell you, a lot of people, uh, when I see, when I watch a zombie movies, what always looks to me, this is why I can't speak of this film in, in, in specifics. I don't remember it well enough, like how they move. But speaking in general, watching zombie movies, I think a lot of them default to Night of the Living Dead. Where they're you're kind of like lethargic and sleepy, right? And then and then sometimes you're a little more strained than you're making a, a face and you're you're like stumbling around or you're basically acting like you're, you're drunk uh, for the most part. So that's kind of like the the go to when I see a zombie that and then just a horrified face as you go walk around like you're drunk and hungry. Um, yeah, and, you are. and and yeah, that's very kind of stereotyped movement now and. Yeah. Um, you, as the audience, I, I have a feeling that people are tapped into this mm -hmm. on a subconscious level where the audience is like, okay, I'm, I'm going to see a, a zombie and it's going to do this. Okay. And then when they do that, you're not really giving them what they want. You're giving them what they're expecting and that's not good. You want to give them some, you want to give them something that they're not expecting so that they rethink what it means to be undead. Yeah. Cause no one ever talks about the intelligence factor of, of zombies. Like, you know, you look at some zombie movies like, uh, what's that one with, 
that kid from the X-Men who played the Beast. Uh, something body, something, you know, where, where zombies, people are zombies, but they're slowly coming back to humanity. Oh. Uh, you know, where you can yeah, see that there's, there's more intelligence and they become more and more intelligent as they go. So then the movement are, are sort of informed by how much intelligence is in, in their character at that time. Hmm. So, I, but, I, but I think most zombie movies are just kind of like, they're just cannon fodder. No one really thinks about, you know, what these zombies are, what they do. They go, oh, you're just a mindless thing. You just want to eat brain. So everybody just kind of, you know, okay, we just do what we've already seen. Uh, so I think really that's really more of the, the, the fault of the writers or the director, right. you know, just not doing more with it. That's true. But maybe it wasn't necessary. It's true. I mean, I remember when 28 Days Later came out and everybody was sort of th thrown a curveball with that one because now but zombies are... Yeah, and all, yeah. All, all they did was they made the zombies go fast, right? That was like the big... And yeah. they, they, they and not just fast, like they were determined. Fast and determined. Yeah. That kind of zombies, for some reason, never scared me because I always looked at that as like, well, they're not really zombies. They're more like just bunch of rabbit cokeheads, you know. Hmm. I, I just want to, you know, or they're like guys are raiding for this rabbit. That's it's scary, like, you know, isn't it? Yeah, it's scary in a different way. It's, yeah. it's scary in a human way. Right. It's not scary in like a supernatural. Right. Way. You know, what makes zomb zombies scary to me is the supernatural element of that they're slow and they're like, there's something more ethereal and not really human. Whereas when they move with so much intelligence, yeah. they become too. That's interesting. So do you think that the Chinese zombie then is kind of closer to what you're talking about, that sort of supernatural zombie? Oh, that's freaky, man. The, 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 the Chinese zombies. Yeah, the way they hop. Who the hell came up with that? And and some people view it as funny. That terrified me as a kid. Yeah, that's the last thing you would expect a dead person to do is to hop. <laughs> yeah, why do they do that? I don't know. I have no idea why they hop, but it's the hopping is terrifying. It comes from something. And then you have to put yeah. that little like threat, that little like bar at the threshold of your house so they can't jump over it. Yeah, yeah. That's real. Those are that's actually in houses. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I've never seen a Chinese zombie in real life, uh, but you know, but hey, you know, build those things to your house. Why not? Just in case. Right? Alpha fo Alpha Proto made an interesting point that they hop because they have rigor mortis. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. It's possible. I wonder if there's some less functional reason that they that they jump though. I wonder if it has. I don't. Know. It's an interesting, interesting question to pose. Well, I just remember when I first time I saw Mr. Vampire, I thought that was brilliant. How entertaining it was, and how all the mythology behind the the and all that stuff it was actually very cool. And the whole breathing thing was fun, you know. Yeah. Definitely, definitely good stuff. Oh yeah, that's that's true. I mean, like. You get that tension. It's a different kind of tension with the slow zombie. Yeah. Even like the you know Romero zombies. There's a, there is this like tension with them that yeah. the slow zombies are more terrifying to me than rapid pack of, of zombies because they start to look more like a mob of humans. And sure, that's scary, but it's not scary on a. I don't feel it's scary on a on a, a, a primal level. You know, it's a different kind of scare. Hmm. If you if you could make a zombie movie, how would you have them move? Or I guess, yeah, yeah. There you go. All right, perfect, perfect answer. <laughs> how else would they move? They gotta move. <laughs> um, I've never thought about it actually. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever. Well, you know what? I, I I'll take it back. There was a there was a movie that I almost made. At the end, near the end of the scene, there was a guy fighting about forty zombies martial arts stuff um and these guys these zombies were supernatural so it was going to be some magic and some stuff it was going to be a lot of fun but i never got, never got to that i guess i would have found out how it would have been maybe your uh sequel to drive can have zombies but like they, they can be robot zombies where they're just kind of like half there half not totally why not <laughs> all right the uh the other clip that you picked and it's not necessarily a clip you you mentioned Rurouni Kenshin yeah. um and I think just talking broadly about the action in Rurouni Kenshin um uh, now you mentioned that you love these action scenes and they're they're awesome these are um you know uh, Kenji's 
Tenji, Kiji Tanagaki's work. What do you like about Rurouni Kenshin? I like I like that it's kind of a hybrid of it, it broke away from tradition. You know, when you look at a lot of the samurai movies, right? Everybody, it's it's kind of like a it's like a standoff, like a western standoff. Two guys standing with a gun, and then whoever shoots first, it gets the kill. And for me, traditionally, samurai films have been kind of in that same sort of vein of very quickly you stand there, there's a tense, and people come in. Instead of one standoff, you're doing quick standoff with a bunch of guys, and then you're, and it's over. Um, what I love about that, like it, like that that school of fighting, is it's fun and it's kind of magical in its own way, but you never really believed it really you know because like you know one guy two guys maybe but then when you start seeing guy coming like this knowing he's gonna get cut in the stomach but the whole time he never he watched 10 guys get killed that way but he, he still comes in that way you're kind of like okay that's a little, a little too much so i think what i liked about that was that uh remember that movie years ago i think steven seagal may have choreographed this fight it was um was this scott glenn there was some movie at the end where, where he was fighting another guy with a samurai sword and it was the most haphazard, crazy two guys going at each other with samurai swords. And he's like running and diving under tables and like guys going bum, 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 bum. And he's just like, it was, it was really messy. But it was very, it, from what my memory of it was, that it was very believable. Like if two guys with samurai swords and the trained killers, you know, they would throw all form out. They would just go for it, try to kill each other as fast as way they can. Um, and I feel like Roni Kenshin was sort of a hybrid of, that and traditional samurai. There's still a bit of flash involved, but because of the, the the freneticness of it, you know, and how it's still how coordinated he was, I think it created a very kind of new sense of, of movement, a new sense of style that I thought was visually very, very pleasing. Um, yeah. I have a I have a soft spot for the old school. I, I, I feel for this guy. I really do. And I and I know <laughs> I know that when this guy comes in, I know what's gonna happen to him. But I still, I, I kind of cheer for that guy now, you know, this poor guy, like, cause I knew, we all know it's going to just go with it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I, we, we know, we know what you're trying to go for, man. And we know you're going to die. Uh, but the death is going to be cool. Right. It's almost like you're flipping the script a little bit because with the, with, the, with this guy, his death is the move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> he condemned himself with with that move yeah well yeah this move is is no good but when he gets cut and he dies that performance too is like that's sort of his move right yeah this is my no favorite yeah. yeah my favorite after guy is cut is basically this movement he'll, he'll drop the sword he'll freeze up with his shoulders up he'll do one of these twists and go like that's my favorite you know because you see it like in every fight yeah um but they're but you know they're giving they're giving a performance you know yeah they are so, and i mean there's that they're uh Ruben talks about this in his episode coming up. There's an art form to being a background guy in Japanese chambara. Yeah, in absolutely. fact, the first year when I understand at Toei, they just teach you footwork. Mm -hmm. to, if you're those guys, right? You're learning mm -hmm. footwork so that you don't step on other people. And so that you can be a, a formidable background guy. And what I love too, is that when you pause any of those movies, you look at any of those guys or just play it and watch any of them and they're all acting like they're all interesting they're all interesting dudes to watch um and yet this happens you know exactly what's going to happen it's very, you know it's very obvious what's going to happen and then kenji sort of flips the script and it's like let's not worry too much about what all these guys are doing we're in it with the main character this sort of like this flow mm -hmm. with the with the protagonist mm -hmm. and we're showing the guys eat it too which again was something that toei never showed when it, when this guy when he goes down usually he falls off camera you don't even you're on the hero <laughs> in, in the pose right so the whole thing is flipped and uh it's a really interesting innovation uh that kenji uh, introduced i mean it's that very hong kong style filmmaking right yeah and what i also like about it too is that in between all these fancy crazy frenetic moves there's they're feeling each other out too you know they're poking they're doing little things to try to get people to to kind of overshoot or to react so they can come in and do their attack and i think something like that really was something you don't see in samurai either just this this anticipation you yeah. know of, 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 of how to bait an enemy to attack you and vice versa i think that that was kind of a fun new element in life like that. and samurai would 
sort of talk before the action even started. And that talk, you could argue, is even fight choreography in a way because this kind of goes back to what we were talking about with the the bifurcation of what humans yeah. do, right? It's like, let's mm -hmm. let's talk. Let's try not to do this. Let's just talk, right? Let's talk our way out of it. No, I want revenge. Are you sure you want to do this? I want revenge. And then eventually, of course, it has to go this way. And, you know, all of that dialogue at the beginning is like part and parcel to the fight. Mm -hmm. um, but... In running Kenshin, yeah, he's, he's really made action the star where that dialogue now is in movement, mm -hmm. which makes it more internationally appealing too, I think. Yeah, I just I just love that series. Man. I've seen all five movies, I don't know how many times. We, my wife and I, we do that as a regular watch. Like every six months, we'll come back and watch it. Because we both love that series. Yeah. Uh, Alpha Proto asks again, does that go back to Kabuki Theater's exaggerated movements? Yeah, Japanese movement in general is like a, I, that's a whole nut that I think would be so interesting to crack. Yeah, well, you should talk to a, one of the experts. About stuff. I'm definitely yeah. not an expert. I'm more of an observer, but, I'm, but you probably definitely delve delve into it a lot deeper than I. Than I. I'm trying to. I'm getting in trouble doing that, Steve. I, I've 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 learned too much. Um, what? I'm, I'm, How are you being troubled for something like that? No, no, it's it's because it's it's actually what learning all this stuff learning from you and learning from you know all these people i'm talking to um you know it on the one hand i guess you could say it sort of like breaks it breaks all the it, it really just turns it into a um a very you're taking the art and you're 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 turning it into a science almost right you're demystifying it yeah you're demystifying it yeah which i think is healthy Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, it's actually making it hard for me to be critical. Mm -hmm. Like I, I like way more stuff than I used to. I think this is kind of a weakness now with me because I now I watch all of these old like, you know, I'll watch like Born Identity. I'll watch stuff that's like, you know, like the stunt community very much frowns on at times, and I'll go like, no, I can actually see why this is really good now. Yeah, I think I think because the, I think. You're really experiencing the more you understand something, the more you learn to appreciate. And I think that's that's really the very natural thing. You know, you, you can't appreciate some things unless you understand it. Because we we tend to just gloss over things a lot. We'll see something go, ah, I don't like that. But then when you see how it's done, you may not like it anymore, but you go, Wow, but that was really amazing. Yeah. They had to do that. You know, I think there's just an intrinsic appreciation that happens when people understand. And they, I think that that's important. I think if everybody understands how films are made, they'd be less critical. Because it's just as much work to make a shitty movie as it is a great movie. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> no difference, right? Yeah, with yeah, this is, yeah, with far less payoff. Yeah. yeah. Um, Steve, uh, it's been an hour and a half. And okay. uh, thank you so much for doing the live stream. There were some awesome questions today. Thank you all for joining us. Yeah, my um, pleasure. I love that we had a philosophical discussion. I think that this is like, this is the meat and potatoes of, this is why I do the podcasts because of mm -hmm. conversations like this. So thank you. Um, yeah, my, my pleasure. Really I nice. always love chatting with you because it's different. <laughs> yeah, good. I, like I, I I'm, I'm happy. Yeah, it's, and I, you know, I know I, I know the questions get very philosophical sometimes, but I think everything is philosophical. Sure. Um, yeah, at the core. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate you're very, you know, you're very transparent about how you see things, and that was uh, that's very cool. So it was great to know you better as an artist and as a person. So thank you again for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you everybody who tuned in and you know, who watched this. It's been a great time. And watch Eric's stuff. He's amazing. He's an amazing fighter, choreographer, martial artist, actor, and philosopher. <laughs> All right, thanks, Steve.